you have a white collar crime unit. In fact, our white collar crime unit will be announcing a major arrest tomorrow, but our white collar crime unit is probably the largest in the state of Pennsylvania, working uh, on white collar crime, but also on senior exploitation issues, trying to protect our seniors. We have crime scene units, individuals that are highly trained in DNA analysis, fingerprint analysis, processing blood splattering crime scenes that go out. Crime scenes, these local municipalities, especially on homicide cases. Fortunately, here in Delaware County, we have anywhere between 30 to 35 homicides in a given year, and ranks the third highest in Pennsylvania. We're third behind, of course, Philadelphia being the number one or to processing cases, Pittsburgh, as you would expect, being number two, and then Delaware County being number three, which is significant when you look at Southeast Pennsylvania. We also have a child abuse unit, the district attorney's office. We have a bomb unit that goes out. If you have any type of bomb errors or threats or packages, they, of course, see a lot of. Uh, we are telling people if you see something to say something, so we'll get called regularly if something looks suspicious, make sure it's not an explosive, excuse me, explosive device. We also have, of course, our Internet Crimes Against Children Unit. That's what you're going to hear a little bit about today. Delaware County, only the state of Pennsylvania, has the Internet Crimes Against Children Unit. Federal grant, we search the Internet. We're looking for child predators. We're looking for child pornography. In all the cases that we're prosecuting on a yearly basis, the most shocking the amount of child pornography that is out there. It's staggering the amount of child pornography. We're working on a daily basis. You're going to hear today from uh, one of our detectives. You're going to hear from our deputy. I'm very fortunate in the district office. Any success in the office of the district attorney is really my staff. We have an incredible staff. One of those members of the staff is the Deputy District Attorney with us today. His name is Michael Galantino. Michael Galantino lectures not only across the state of Pennsylvania on issues dealing with special <coughs> victims, cybercrime, child pornography, sexual predators, but across the entire country lecturing, educating attorneys, police departments, and lay people over issues. I think today, probably the hardest job in the world, not me up here being your district attorney, our police, which are, we have incredible police here in Delaware County that visit their lives every day, and they have a very tough job. One of the toughest jobs out there today is being a parent, facing some of the problems that we're seeing today with our youth. It used to be we were always dealing with drugs and trying to make sure that our are kept safe from drugs and are educated about dangers of drugs. But today, it's a whole new world. Everybody is walking around with cell phones, their pocketbook, or on their head. Everybody has a computer right in this device. This device is capable of so many great things, but it's also capable of so many evil things. So many crimes are committed through the internet and through social media, information that's being related. That's what you're going to hear about today. You're going to hear about the dangers of cell phone. I went to a class not too long ago. It was an elementary class. We have programs in the district attorney's office anywhere from elementary all the way up to college kids talking about cell phones, cyberbullying, problems associated with cell phones. And when we're talking about it, I had a fourth grade class. In the fourth grade class, I asked them to raise their hand. I said, how many children have cell phones? Almost every single child raised their hand to say that they had a smartphone their parents had given them. And so we are facing challenges with phones. You're going to hear some stories about people contacting children on their cell phone. Predators trying to talk those young ladies or young boys, coming and meeting them for illicit purposes, for criminal purposes. And you're going to hear about the apps that are out there challenging us all as parents. You're probably going to leave here today very uneasy feeling. Uneasy feeling because you're saying, geez, 
All of this is out there, tempting our children or our grandchildren. All of this is out there to corrupt them, victimize them. But in the district attorney's office, I can assure you that we are working on a daily basis to make sure that these dangerous predators, individuals that are dealing with child pornography, are investigated and where appropriate, where appropriate, arrested, prosecuted. And you're going to hear some of the cases we have in the office where we had to arrest, prosecute, and And finally, when we look at the cell phone, I can tell you from an investigative standpoint, cell phone is a great friend of us. Because we find so much information on our cell phone. When we go to a crime scene, first thing we're looking for, you can imagine, is cell phones. In the old days, it was fingerprint evidence, uh, bullet casings, shell casings, uh, DNA evidence. Now we're looking for cell phones. Because we know, once we get the cell phone, there's a wealth of information, typically, in this cell phone, of communication, or evidence in here, dealing with crime. It's a murder in the city of Chester. came from Philadelphia. They killed the clerk. Left him. Shot him. They were robbing a, a right aid in the city of Chester. We knew there were perpetrators of the deal evidence. They had fingerprints. But it wasn't until we got the cell phone, we were able to link three others that planned the crime. Those three others were prosecuted just because of the information in our cell phone. The detective that did that, the detective led the charge, testified, able to get those individuals convicted. Here with us today, I'd ask Ed to stand up, be recognized, Ed Pisani. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, he did just get off of 21 Jump Street. <laughs> But Ed is a fabulous detective. You're going to have the privilege of hearing from him today. He is a computer forensic expert. And we're going to ask one member, one member of the audience, give us your cell phone. Because what we're going to be able to do, take all your pictures, text messages, all your emails, and we're going to put them up on that screen for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. But what we are going to do, what we are going to do is we're going to tell you how we do that. The kids and people. We walk into a room of kids, high school kids, talking about the cell phone, start talking about how we can access all their information. All of a sudden, they start phoning out and start deleting. So we're going to tell you that once you delete information, whether it's emails, pictures, text messages, we can retrieve that information. If it's within a certain period of time or it's overwritten, we can actually extract that information. Much of that information has led us be able to criminally prosecute individuals and use that evidence in court of law in order to get somebody convicted that may not otherwise have been convicted. So I thank you. We're going to come back at the end of this seminar. We're going to answer any questions that you have toward the end of the seminar after you hear, hear from the guest speakers. But from the district attorney's office, you'll have Detective Ed Pisani and Deputy District Attorney Mike Galantino. So I'd like to introduce Mike Galantino to you. And after Mike's presentation, you'll hear from Ed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Get out of the way so I'm not blocking the screen. So as Jack told you, our Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force covers the entire state of Pennsylvania. And we partner with all of the other law enforcement agencies and county prosecutors through, across the state. We also part, partner nationally with other Internet Crimes Task Forces as each state has one, and hopefully this will work. So we, we respond to cases involving Internet crimes against children. We do three different types of things. One is reactive, in which we respond to tips that we get from different departments, different agencies, even individuals and parents. The second is proactive, in which our detectives go undercover and uh, infiltrate websites, infiltrate chat rooms, look for uh, ads and, and, and things like that out there in which people are trying to lure children, trying to prey upon children. And in many cases, our detectives go undercover and pose as children themselves or pose as parents with children who are willing to offer those children to individuals on the Internet for sexual favors. And believe it or not, those people are actually out there. Uh, we work with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Virginia, uh, which is an amazing clearinghouse of cyber tips 
uh, their fu part of their function is to try to find missing kids, but another part of their function is to look for exploited children and reunite those children with their families, but also to work with law enforcement and let us get started with cases. So a cyber tip comes in from uh, anywhere around the world. It, if, if they don't know what jurisdiction it goes to, it goes to the National Center, and then from the National Center, if it's a Delaware County case or a Pennsylvania case, it comes to us. Um, our task for, force, as I said, is a national operation. Every state has at least one ICAC. Uh, some have three or four. California, I think, has five now. There's a quick map. I'm not going to go through the whole map, but as you can see, they're out there. Uh, some of the most popular social media sites, I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, you're all familiar with Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, or Pinterest, Google+, a lot of others out there. Um, Instagram, very popular with young people in high school these days. Uh, a lot of image and video sharing sites like Flickr. Uh, Snapchat. Snapchat, if you remember, was really famous a few years ago because kids believed, uh, in fact, they were told as part of the terms of service that you could take a picture of anything, send it to somebody, and you can control how long that picture would be on their phone. And so it was a great idea for a young girl in the mall to take a picture of a dress, send it to her friends, and say, hey, what do you think? Um, and she'd get instant feedback on a purchase. The downside was a lot of young people got this false sense of security that they could take what we refer to as a naked selfie picture, uh, and you'd be amazed at how many young people were doing that. A lot of young girls would send it to her boyfriend because, of course, she can trust him, and he's not going to share that picture with anybody, right? And you can trust a 15-year-old boy in that, in that situation. What kids quickly learned was how easy it was to take a screen capture on the recipient's phone. Anybody that with a smartphone uh, can use two buttons on an iPhone, for example, and capture whatever image is on their screen, they could then save it forever, send it to anywhere they want, upload it to the internet. And a lot of young people were suddenly discovering that their images that they took of themselves were being broadcast all over the school or even all over the world on the internet. Uh, there are a couple of others here. Kick Messenger, uh, a lot of kids using Kick could communicate with each other without their parents' knowledge. Text messages and other things that they shared on Kick or through Kick Messenger would not show up on the parent's phone bill. So if you got a phone bill that ch had your child's uh, cell phone on there, you wouldn't see calls or, 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 I'm sorry, text messages or other communications that were sent uh, to and from that child through Kick because it didn't go through your regular messaging service. The other problem with Kick was that it's based in Canada. So from a law enforcement standpoint, if we got a cyber tip involving Kick, it was very difficult to get legal process served on a Canadian corporation to try to get records back from them and to get cooperation. Um, Yik Yak takes it a step further. It, it geolocates so that anybody that's on Yik Yak uh, can send a message and other people that can see the message can know exactly where that person is at that moment. Uh, there are a few others out there. Omegle, which advertises itself as free stranger chat. Imagine how enticing that is to a high school kid. Um, WhatsApp, very popular among European kids who come to this country for visits. Uh, a few others out here, and my favorite, Meet Me, which is advertised itself as friends, flirts, and fun. And of course, a lot of these apps, uh, as part of their terms of service, they require that the child say that they're 18 years of age, but it's simply a box that they check or, or a number that they type in. We have a lot of 10, 11, and 12-year-olds that are on many of these social media apps and doing a lot of dangerous things, uh, but they've said they were 18, so they're able to defeat any kind of challenges. Just some basics. When we used to do search warrants in cases, we were always looking for the desktop, the laptop, the tablet, but so many other things now are communication devices. Did anybody realize, for example, that children can communicate on the internet through that PlayStation or the Wii or the portable gaming devices that are out there? So if a child has an internet-enabled device, they can communicate with other people uh, almost flawlessly through many of these other, these other toys. And as far as storage media goes, we would look for the old-fashioned uh, desktop, the DVDs, the portable hard drives. But now we're seeing smartphones, these tiny disks, and evidence based in the cloud. So a lot of people are using the cloud that don't even realize it. If you have an iPhone, for example, and you're backing up to iCloud, your information is there. So if we seize a phone involving somebody who's a victim of a, of a sexual assault, and we uh, work on the phone, we hold onto the phone, we take the evidence from the phone, if the parent goes out and buys them a new cell phone, uh, and that's happened in several cases, and the child logs onto their iCloud account, they instantly download all the same dangerous material that we thought we had control of that we've taken off of that phone. 
Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one case where a little girl did exactly that. Um, this isn't that case. This is a case out of Florida. It's an example of cyberbullying. This little 12-year-old girl was cyberbullied by as many as 15 of her peers at one point. She started receiving text messages saying things like, you're ugly, why are you still alive? Go kill yourself. Imagine a 12-year-old girl at that stage in her, in her middle school life where peers mean everything to her, and she's hearing things like this. They use all different apps to get to this girl. Kick, Ask, Instagram, a bunch of others. Uh, her mother tried to take her out of school, tried to change schools to help her out. Um, it went on for a year and a half. Eventually, her mother took her out of school and homeschooled her for a little bit. That didn't work, and she committed suicide in 2013. Two of the girls were charged in the state of Florida with stalking after they posted this message on Facebook. Yes, I K, which means I know, I bullied Rebecca and she killed herself, but I D G A F, sort of like I don't care. All right? Imagine a 13 year old girl saying that about a 12 year old who just committed suicide, I D G A F. Um, in Florida, by the way, the sh local sheriff there arrested her. This was in Polk County, Florida charged the, I'm, I'm sorry, the rest of the girls that were involved, charged them with stalking. The district attorney or the prosecutor in the county had to drop the charges because their stalking statute didn't fit this situation uh, clearly enough. Pennsylvania has since adopted a statute that allows us to prosecute cyberbullying cases a little bit more effectively. Um, sexting. Sexting is rampant in middle schools and high schools in our area. I've gone out and talked to middle schools in our community, some of them in the nicest areas of Delaware County, and as I talk to the sixth graders and I talk about sexting, I get a lot of hands raised because they'll say, well, I heard a friend of mine or somebody that I know had this happen to them. When I get to the seventh or eighth graders, especially the eighth graders, and I talk about, as Jack mentioned, what can be found on the phone, I see kids feverishly deleting things quickly. And I had one situation where after a presentation to parents at a middle school, one mother went home and talked to her daughter and discovered that her daughter was sexting, that is, sending sexually explicit pictures of herself, to some guy in Florida that the daughter assumed was a peer. The fact is, we have no idea how old the other person was. So here's a case in a middle school sexting in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Sorry, this is jumping around a little bit. Um, four middle school students charged with sexting and cyberbullying. It started with a 13-year-old girl who gave intimate photos of herself to her then-boyfriend. And again, they have that trusting relationship, uh, which as soon as the relationship is over, the boyfriend can do whatever he wants with the pictures, and, and often that's how these cases begin. Uh, eventually, they broke up. He shared the photos with others. And three boys, including the girl, were, the girl's ex-boyfriend, were ch facing charges. Uh, the fourth boy was charged in a similar but unrelated case. In other words, when his phone was checked, they didn't find the images of this girl, but they found other images. One of the challenges that we had to deal with in our office the first time we had a case like this was how do you treat the people who create the images? In other words, they're creating child pornography of themselves. And so we had to wrestle with how we're going to prosecute that, but also being sensitive to the fact that they are the victims as well. And, and one of the thoughts that came through our discussion was that there's not much that we can say to those two young people that's going to drive the point home any further than what's already happened to them. That is that they've, ex they've been exploited and that everybody in their school, at least everybody that they know, has seen their pictures and their videos. Here's an online enticement case that one of our detectives investigated. This sort of looks like a typical teenage girl's uh, bedroom. I have a 17-year-old. This is what her floor looks like sometimes. All right. This is the one picture of this series that I can show you because the others uh, show this girl in various stages of undress or nudity. But eventually, uh, this started as a tip, a cyber tip from Nick Mac to us, and this girl, Cutie Stacy, was uploading images of herself, including naked images of herself. She was also reaching out to other girls, uh, sort of saying, hey, you know, I'm not sure about my body, here's my body, what do you think, do I look normal, can I see pictures of your body? And believe it or not, she got several young girls to send pictures of themselves, including naked pictures of themselves, back to her. And this went on for quite some time. She used several different social media platforms. Um, she got several victims to send nude selfies. She was actually this guy, all right? Wasn't a girl at all. And kids don't understand sometimes that the people that you meet on the internet, even if they send you a picture or they send you a, a, a story that sounds like you're talking to a kid, they're often people like this. Here's another guy, and this is the case that occurred uh, in, in, in our county in which a young girl was 13 she was communicating with this guy 
um, and sending him very explicit messages, including photos of herself. Um, her mother discovered it one morning. Her mother got up early one morning, went to wake her daughter, saw that the phone was beeping, that there was a message that had come in, and just out of curiosity, the mother touched the phone and, and saw the message. And the message was a, a message from this guy talking about when they were going to meet up for sex. Um, so he met her through chat apps. He started sending explicit messages to her. Um, and eventually, when her mother found the message, her mother brought the phone to our police, and our detectives took over the girl's identity with the mother's permission. So they continued the conversation with him to try to get information about who he was, where he was, and when would he be willing to meet. The defendant actually told our police, well, I get off from work at a certain time, I get dropped off by my boss, uh, as soon as I get dropped off at my house, I'll jump in my car and I'll come and meet you. And our detectives were there ready to meet him. Um, he was eventually convicted of criminal solicitation to commit various sex acts. He's currently in state prison serving his term. What's unique about this case is that as soon as our detectives started working on it and using this girl's cell phone to try to figure out who this predator was, the mother bought the child a brand new iPhone. The girl immediately logged onto her own account, downloaded all the same material that had been on the first phone, and started communicating with a second guy in exactly the same manner. The second guy was out of Ohio. This guy, um, we learned about him when the mother found on the second phone that the girl was engaging in the same exact types of communications. Uh, met this girl through the same chat apps, convinced her to send images of herself. Eventually, we partnered with our ICAC unit uh, counterparts in Ohio, and when the Ohio authorities went to serve a search warrant on the defendant's house, or the suspect at that time, his house, his wife said, he's not here right now. He's back in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, on a business trip. Well, it wasn't a business trip at all. He was actually outside of Delaware County uh, trying to figure out how to get to this little girl's house to meet up with her for sex. If our detectives hadn't acted quickly to apprehend him, uh, he would have been able to prey upon her that very day. Not sure what that was. Uh, he was also searching the victim's address on Google Maps at the time. So here's a, a CSE is child sex exploitation. I told you that in addition to reactive cases, we do proactive cases. Uh, here's one where one of our detectives created an online profile of a 14-year-old boy. We had information that Craigslist was becoming a hotbed for older men who wanted to meet young kids, young boys primarily. And so our detective created this profile of a boy, and he discovers an ad on Craigslist, and the defendant wasn't shy about what he was looking for. Older perv looking for young. It's right out there. We don't have to work hard to find these people. Um, the detective advised the suspect that he's 14, almost 15. He's 5'7", 130 pounds. Was this you, Ed? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so here's a, here, here, these are actually a couple of screen captures from the chats. I'm good. I'm 14, almost 15, 5'7", 130. HBU, how about you? Uh, they always want stats. They always want to know what our kid looks like. The suspect says, where are you from? What all you want to get into? Got to pick... They always want a picture because they, they, they're pretty savvy, many of them. They know that we're not going to send them a child pornographic image. Obviously, we're not going to commit a crime. Um, and so a lot of times, we'll send a picture that's an innocuous picture, usually of one of our detectives when they were younger, uh, maybe a, a detective who's now in his early 20s who has a baseball team picture when he was 14 or 15. All right, We're certainly not going to put child porn out there. So they always want to trade a pick to try to verify that we're real, that we're not actually a cop. This actually occurred um, not far. The detective uh, said, I'm in, I'm in Aston. I'm from Aston. I'm new to this. Not really sure. They go on with the conversations. The suspect says, you're looking to meet up and have fun. Uh, our detective plays along. And our detectives will always sort of play along. They'll play the role of a kid. They'll say things like, I'm not sure. What do you want to do? What does that mean? I've never done that before. Is that going to be you know, a certain? Is that going to hurt? Or is that going to be, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not really ready to take that step. And they let the suspect take the lead so that it's clear that it's his intentions uh, to carry out certain acts. The suspect says, we can meet tomorrow at noon and come back to my place and have fun all afternoon. Those are the suspect's words. He goes into more explicit language here that I'm not going to use. Um, so the first contact was at 10.53 p.m. Within less than an hour, he suggested sex to our kid, who was actually an undercover detective. Uh, he sent nude photos of himself to the detective. He also sent nude photos of other kids that he'd actually communicated and done things with to our detective. So when judges say to us, do these crimes really occur? 
if it weren't for the stings, we can say unequivocally yes. He also chatted and solicited with another under detect undercover detective at the exact same time. So we had two detectives working the same kind of cases, and this suspect was talking to both of them at the same time. In the other case, he's talking about wanting to do kinky things, he wants the, the victim to be daddy's boy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, at least he shared some good advice for us. Later in the chats, he says, if you're really interested in meeting an older guy, just don't mention your age. Just say you're looking, that you're a young, curious guy looking to learn, but be careful. Lots of nuts and weird people out there. <laughs> so true. <clears throat> um, there are spyware apps out there. We don't get a lot of these cases, but they're, but they're possible, where a victim can have a spyware app implanted on their phone. Uh, a young girl, for example, that's in a relationship with a guy, and he has access to her phone, maybe he knows her phone password or it's not password protected, and she gets up and goes to the restroom and he plays on her phone. It's very easy for somebody to download a spyware app on somebody else's phone. They only need a few minutes of access to the phone to accomplish that. And typically it's undetectable to the user, but it can send all kinds of information out there, like lo call logs, text messages, contacts, call recordings, um, so that the stalker can know exactly where the victim is, what he or she is doing, who they're talking to. Uh, and we've had cases where the suspect will say something to the victim like, hey, I know you're talking to so-and-so out there. I know you were at uh, Nifty Fifties with, with such and such the other day. They're able to track their victims using this type of spyware. All right, I'm going to skip kind of through this. We don't get a lot of these cases. Um, in response to some of these sexting cases, Pennsylvania passed a statute a few years ago uh, called Transmission of a Sexually Explicit Image by a Minor. It allowed us to deal with the kids who were sending these images of themselves without charging them with the felony of child pornography. The adult charge for someone that collects, sends, or creates child pornography is a felony, and it can put somebody on Megan's Law in some cases for life. All right? We recognize that that's necessary for adult offenders collecting these pictures and sharing these pictures. But when a child does it to themselves, it's a little bit different. And, and so we've had to wrestle with that. And the state created this law, which makes it a summary offense for somebody to transmit, distribute images of themselves or to possess images of, a minor, of another minor who's 12 or older. It goes up to a misdemeanor if they knowingly transmit images of another minor who's 12 years of age or older. And then it goes on from there. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through this again, too, because I know we're a little bit late on time. What's important for kids to know is that this sexting statute, which is a lower charge, does not apply if the image is a sexually explicit act. So nudity standing in front of the mirror in the bathroom can be a reduced charge if a minor takes that of themselves. But if they're actually video recording a sex act or sharing images of a sex act, um, or if it's done for a commercial purpose. And we've had some cases where a 16, 17-year-old is making money by sharing images of other students around the school. Um, that, that goes back to the felony charge. With respect to child exploitation, the statute is called sexual abuse of children. It involves photographing, videotaping children under the age of 18 in a sexually explicit pose or an act, or possessing, I'm sorry, dissemination of photographs, images, etc or possessing, intentionally viewing or knowingly possessing. And I get this question a lot. You know, what if you're opening an email and you see something that you didn't expect, you didn't ask for? That can happen to anybody, all right? If somebody just sees something by accident that, that somebody sent to them and they click off of it, delete it, they want nothing to do with it, then there's no evidence that they intended to view these things. But we don't get those kinds of cases. We get those kinds of inquiries and we don't charge those cases. The ones that we get are people that are intentionally going back to websites again and again, doing other things with their computer, indicating their intent to look at these pictures or to surf these websites. There's another charge called unlawful contact with a minor, which involves somebody who's intentionally communicating with a minor for the purpose of sexual abuse or sexual exploitation. And I'm gonna kind of run through this quickly. A new charge that was developed a few years ago, I refer to it as revenge porn. Um, you might be familiar with situations that occurred in California and with some celebrities where somebody's in a relationship, they break up, and then their pictures get put all over the internet. Uh, Pennsylvania passed a statute a few years ago, um, which is unlawful dissemination of an intimate, intimate image. Uh, if somebody wants to harass a former partner, a former intimate partner, by sharing pictures of that person that were taken with the person's consent during the relationship, 
and now to get back at them for breaking up, they're gonna send those images to a website or send them to a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend or something like that, uh, that can be a criminal offense. And we've had a couple of cases of this so far. I'm gonna kind of slide through here quickly. So what do we do about all of this now that I've taken a few minutes to scare some people? Um, the third part of what our ICAC does is education. And we go out to schools, we go out to community groups, uh, various places in the neighborhoods, um, and these are some of the tips that we give people. For, for students, guard your login names. Kids often know each other's login names and passwords, and sometimes they'll do funny little things to each other that are harmless, but occasionally things get a little bit more dangerous and kids will get into other kids' accounts and put those other children in danger. Don't assume that people online are who they say they are, and I mentioned that earlier. Keep an open dialogue with parents about, uh, about the internet. If you can't, at least find some trusted adult that you can talk to. For parents, don't allow children to take their devices to bed with them. I know that's really hard. It was easier when my daughters were young because we had a desktop computer that they couldn't physically move. And then when my oldest hit high school and the school issued her a laptop, not only did I not have control over it, I couldn't even get into it because I wasn't an authorized user. So she suddenly could get in the internet anytime she wanted, anywhere she wanted. One of our districts gave out iPads, not my district, gave out iPads to grade school kids. And when I went to do a presentation at their high school uh, to talk about some of the dangers, a parent said, how can I control what my daughter's doing on the iPad? And the school uh, I, IT person said, well, don't worry about it because our school building has filters set up on our server that the kids can't get out to certain sites from our school building. The follow-up question was, well, what if my daughter goes across the street to McDonald's or Starbucks or someplace else that has an open Wi-Fi? Complete silence from the IT director because he knew at that point that there was no way to protect those kids when they went out to a, a, a public server at a place like McDonald's. Since then, they've put software on the devices that blocks them from accessing certain types of sites. Um, try to monitor what's on your kids' phones. If you buy the phone for your child, you should know what's on it. And it's perfectly okay for you to demand that you get to see the phone, including any apps that might be on there and what the child's doing. Um, establish rules, what they can do, where they can visit, and so forth, what they can download. Uh, in my case, I kept the password to my daughter's accounts. So if they wanted to download a new app, they had to come to me for me to see what the app was and approve it by entering the password. Um, take a look at cell phone records for anything that's unusual. If your child's talking to somebody at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, if they're using the regular phone or, or the regular text messaging, text messaging on your account, that should show up on your bill. Um, remind your children that anything that they put on the internet can easily be shared. Anything that they send to somebody else can easily be shared. Virtually everything is public these days on these devices. Um, teach your children never to reveal pa uh, cell phone pa uh, numbers or passwords online. Um, look for phones that have security settings that you can control. Um, and teach them not to put personal information. One of our detectives did a demonstration a few years ago where he showed how easy it was to stalk a child. Um, and essentially, he took a child, and it was a case study that he had worked on, and he showed that all he had to do was find out her name. From her name, he found out what middle school she went to, what town she lived in, her address, the team she played for. She was on a middle school sports team. She lived close enough to the school that she probably walked home from school after practice. He got the practice schedule, the game schedule. He figured out the route that she'd probably walk home. And since it was this time of day, it was a fall sport, and she'd still be playing in November and December, he figured she'd probably be walking home in the dark after hours. And he showed these parents, who were largely horrified, how easy it was, based on a little bit of personal information, uh, to track this kid down and look for a vulnerable opportunity if he was so inclined. Um, Turn off geolocation if it's not needed. Most of the apps on our smart smartphones automatically geolocate so you know exactly where you are, and that's useful if you lose your phone or you want to try use Google Maps or something like that. But there are a lot of other apps, especially social media apps, where kids don't need to geolocate as they're posting things. Um, know who your children are communicating with. Um, and one other thing that I always tell talk to parents about is make sure your, parent your children can come to you. One of the things that's a natural reaction for a parent to say if my child was approached on the internet or if they got messages from people that they shouldn't be talking to, I'm gonna take away their phone, I'm gonna take away the device. Kids know that. And so if they're afraid that you're gonna block them from the internet, they're not gonna tell you when they are victimized, even with a simple communication. And so 
I recommend always keeping an open line of communication to tell your children that if they come to you and they're seeking help or they're telling you something that they're concerned about, you're, they're not going to be punished for it. They're not going to lose their internet for it as long as they do the right thing and try to keep that communication line open. Um, and then, of course, remember, once it's posted online, they can't take it back. I've had parents say to me, how can I guarantee that my daughter's naked picture is not going to be out there on the internet again six months from now? And I have to look them in the face and say, you really can't. Because anybody that downloaded it or copied it can easily repost it. It could be back up there tomorrow. You know, we can only go so far as to try to limit the damage. Um, and then here's our contact number. This is our CID uh, number. Uh, our website is onlinesafety.com. That's a service of the district attorney's office uh, for further information and some cyber tips. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Ed Pisani. I'm a detective with the Delaware County District Attorney's Office. Um, some of the cases that he had just been talking about are the ones I was actually involved in. Um, so once you have a case and you realize something's gone wrong and you bring it to him and you know, we investigate it and we realize we need to look at devices, that's where I come in. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we examine cell phones. Uh, that's just a little about me. I've been with the DAs uh, since 2010. Uh, I'm assigned to the Internet Crimes Against Ch Children Task Force. That's mainly what I do all the time. Uh, the first step we do if we have a phone is we want to secure it. We don't want the data to change. We place it in airplane mode. Uh, if the phone is off when I get it, uh, I don't want to turn it on because I don't know what's going to happen to it. There could be a remote command to erase it, and that would be very bad. So this box here, we can stick the phone in and reach in through with the gloves, and we can turn the phone on and place it into airplane mode and make sure it's secure and that uh, nothing is going to be remotely wiped or changed. Uh, it's called a Faraday box. This is the actual cell right, so here we're actually dumping a phone. Uh, that tip on the left is yellow. We have special tips that we can plug into a phone and it actually places them into download modes or like some kind of service mode where we can actually download it and uh, bypass the password. Uh, in case there's a phone that's locked, sometimes we can't get around the passcode. Uh, it's not available. This uh, method is actually where we solder wires to the actual motherboard. Uh, we're actually able to pull the memory right off the phone without the phone even being uh, powered on. Uh, it's called JTAG. Uh, if a phone has been damaged, I recently worked on a case that was actually out of a prison. Uh, they can't have cell phones in the prison. Uh, the, the guy knew the guard was coming, so he quick threw the phone into the toilet and tried to flush it. Um, the phone was grabbed, but it had already been damaged. It was too late. It had too much water damage. Uh, so I was actually to, able to remove the chip from the phone. It destroys the phone. Uh, it's a last resort effort. We don't want to do it unless it's the absolute necess necessary to get the information. Uh, in this case, the phone didn't work anyway, so we had nothing to lose. So that's once the chip pops off, this is what it actually looks like. Uh, we have special readers that we can place it into. Uh, and these readers here are able to actually read the memory chip right from the phone. So if the phone's been broken in half, destroyed, wood or damaged, anything, we can still retrieve it. Uh, so this is a case that we had. Uh, it was involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, IDSI. Uh, we had a report come in of a mother said, I found my son's cell phone, and he has messages on there that I'm worried about. And at first look, we you know, examined the messages, and there wasn't anything really there. So we weren't sure what she was talking about. So after I reviewed all the text messages, I actually found out what they were doing. She said, can we move to chat in words with friends or Scrabble? Because Mike is laying in bed watching TV next to me. So the way she was hiding her text messages from her husband was to move to a gaming app that you don't really realize has a chat function built into it. Uh, once we were able to realize that, we were able to go into that database and realize that this is what she was actually talking about. This is the toned down version. Don't be. You're the one I love the most, the one I wanted the most, and the only one that made me weak on my knees. I believe she was in her late 30s, and he was 14. She was ultimately charged and convicted. She ended up pleading guilty. Uh, and this is the one that District Attorney Jack Whalen was talking about earlier. This was actually a, a huge group effort. 
all the way from the forensics on the fingerprints to search warrants, they execute it. Uh, so what happened was the guy broke through the door and put his hand right on the door. Um, one of our fingerprint experts was actually able to lift the fingerprints from that, and they were actually able to arrest that guy and the person that he was with first. Uh, upon examining their cell phones is when we realized that uh, there was more people involved than just these two. Uh, so this is the case I actually worked on. I did nine cell phones. There was two tablets, three social media accounts. Uh, we actually mapped the cell towers of them driving down from Philadelphia, getting off the exit at Highland Ave and getting right to the CVS. Uh, and the one news article, like he was saying, how open source, it's huge for us. Uh, we had a name. We had no idea who this person was. We weren't sure if it was even a boy or a girl. Um, we ha all we had to go off with was a nickname, so we just kept looking through the Internet. And eventually we found an article that used her nickname inside the article that she was there, you know, cleaning up a park in Philadelphia. So that's how we were able to identify the fifth person. So again, we reviewed it. The one guy here, uh, Tarek, he was actually the store security person. He was watching the people put money in the safe and was actually keeping track of how much money she was putting into the safe. So he had notes in his iPhone saying that on you know, such and such date, she put $1,800 in the safe. So they were, you know, they knew when to hit the safe, how to get to it, who was going to be working. Uh, so him being inside, feeding them the outside information was critical to their uh, success. Uh, when I examined his cell phone, uh, there was 3,700 messages. 1,600 were actually deleted, and most of the ones that implicated him were all deleted. Uh, as I mentioned, the notes, he had some notes in there and talked about, you know, which cashier was working and who they should go to. So ultimately, we were able to connect all five people together, and they were all convicted of homicide. So if you come across students, I know you guys are mostly educators, if you come across a student who has a phone, uh, the first thing to do is if it's off, leave it off. If it's on, you can just leave it on, but put it in airplane mode. You should know how to do that. Don't delete anything. I know that we have parents come in and they say, well, we deleted it because I don't want it on there. Can't you get it back? Well, yes, we can get it back, but it's better if it's how it was when you found it. Don't confront the person sending the message because that kind of tips the card. We lose the advantage that, you know, I'm telling the police. Well, now the guy knows that the police are going to be looking at his case, and uh, so that kind of puts us behind the eight ball. And also, don't begin your own investigation. Don't go and start confronting the person if you know who it is. It's very important that, you know, we keep it quiet and that we can do our thing without them knowing. 